and welcome to Nurture Store's colour study videos. My name's Cathy and today our focus is on monochrome art. You can join in and create your own piece of art alongside me as we learn about the colour wheel and have a go at mixing our own tints and shades of colour. We'll be meeting the famous artist James McNeil Whistler and having a look at some of his paintings to see how he uses tints, tones and shades in his art. We'll think about how colours get their names and where in the real world we see tints and shades being used in science. As always with Nurture Store, this is a great activity for relaxation and well-being. It's an easy project using just simple materials so everyone can join in. So come and learn something new, spend some time being mindful and creative and paint along with me. Just before we learn about today's colour theory, let's get our materials ready. I'm using this monochrome printable, which comes from the colour theory pack that I've put together for us. And this pack has all the colour theory lessons in it, details on how to do all the art projects in the series, and links to all the famous art that we're featuring. It also has this brilliant set of printables for all the lessons that you can print out and use to make your teaching or your art projects much easier for you to do. I'll put a link to this pack in the video's description. So come and get yourself a copy to use for yourself or if you're a teacher and want to use it with your class or you're a homeschooler doing art at home with your kids, come and get the pack. Today we're working with paint and you can choose which colour you want to work with. It could be a primary colour, red, blue or yellow, or a secondary colour, that's purple, green or orange. We're going to be using this colour to mix our colour palette and then we're also going to be using it later on in our artwork. I'm going to be using blue because I'm going to be doing an ocean picture. So use blue too if you want to follow along with me exactly. Um, but you can also choose a different colour if you've got an idea for a different painting that you would like to do. Remember, you're the artist in charge of your painting, so you get to choose. And we're going to need white and black paint too, because that's what we're going to use to turn our pure colour into a range of tints and shades so that we've got more options to use for our painting. Okay, so a little bit of colour theory. If you've watched my other videos in this colour theory series, you'll recognise this colour wheel. We've talked about how colours can be grouped as primary colours, that's red, blue and yellow. And we've talked about using those primary colours to mix secondary colours, that's orange, green and purple. And we've also seen how the colour wheel can be split in half to make warm and cool colours. And have a look at my colour theory playlist to see all the lessons and the art projects for all of these aspects of colour theory. Today we're going to look at taking one of the pure colours in the colour wheel and mixing it with either white or black to create a palette of tints and shades. This lets us make a wider selection of colour that we can use to make our paintings more interesting. So we're going to take one colour from the colour wheel and make it lighter and darker. And rather than mixing primary or secondary colours together as we've done in the previous lessons, in this lesson, we're going to choose just one colour and mix it with white and also mix it with black to create a range of tints and shades. So a tint is a colour that has been mixed with white and lightened and a shade is a colour that has been mixed with black and darkened. And you also get a tone, which is a colour that's been mixed with grey and sometimes you call that being neutralised. Okay. So that's what we're going to do first. We're going to make ourselves a colour palette of tints and shades. So choose a colour from the colour wheel that you want to work with. I'm going to do blue for my ocean painting. And you're going to want to make nine blobs of this colour on a plate or on a paint palette. And we'll use these colour blobs to mix our tints and shades and we're also going to be using them for our later artwork. So you're going to want to keep all of your blobs separate throughout our colour mixing experiment so that you've got this range of tints and shades that you can work with later. 
Starting in the centre of the row on the printable, fill in one square with your pure colour. And now we're going to mix little bits of white with our pure colour to fill in the other four squares to the right of the starting point to make our tints. So start by adding only a tiny bit of white to another one of your blobs of pure colour and mixing them together well so that they all blend together the pure colour and the white and then use that to fill in a square that's on the right next to your pure colour. And then use your next blob of colour and add a little bit more white this time to make a slightly lighter tint. Onto the next blob of pure colour, add a little bit more white this time. And finally, even more white to the final blob of your pure colour. And use all this range of tints, getting lighter and lighter and lighter to fill in the squares on your principle. So while I go ahead and make this row of tints, it's interesting to think about how you would describe all these colours that you're creating. If you had to tell someone else what colours you've made, how would you tell them what colours they are? You know, we need to have individual names for colours so that we can talk about them with other people. We need to be able to communicate with others in a way that gets us what we want. If I ask for some buttercup yellow paint to decorate the walls of my house or some robin egg blue fabric to make a shirt, it's important that the decorator or the shop assistant giving me the paint or the fabric understands what colour I'm after. Do you know how colours get their names? Have you ever thought about that? So, as you know, some colours are named for things that are the same colour in nature, such as olive green, named after olives, and lime green, named after the fruit. Some colours are named for things that are usually the same colour in the real world. So, I'm in the UK. If I go into a shop and ask for some paint that is post-box red, people would know what I'm talking about because it's the same colour as all the traditional post boxes in the country. So obviously I speak English and think of colours by their English names, but maybe you speak a different language and I'd be really interested to know what names you use for colours, especially if the names are different to the direct translation from English to the language you speak. And the more names you know for individual colours, the better you can identify the difference. So if you know a hundred different names for different shades of green, you can identify all those different colours. And this can make you a better artist and it could even help you be able to see more colours. So how do you think licorice black is different from midnight blue black? Do you know? Can you imagine? And what about the differences between cornflower blue and periwinkle blue? And what about amber orange and gold orange? So there are some times when it's not critical that we describe colours perfectly, but sometimes we do want to be able to get exactly the colour we're after. For example, if we want a particular colour to be printed out um, on a poster or, you know, for something, um, in the real world or for a colour to be displayed on a website. And the way that we can do that and ensure that we get the exact colour that we're after is give the recipe for the individual colour. And computers can use numbers as a kind of recipe to track how much of a certain colour has been mixed together to make the colour that's wanted and the computer can record this in different codes, which includes things called hex codes, RGB codes, and CMYK codes. Maybe you've heard of those before. RGB codes, for example, tells you how much red, that's the R, how much green, that's the G, and how much blue, that's the B, RGB, is in a colour. So it's like the recipe of how much red and green and blue to mix it together to get the colour that you want. For example, Barbie pink, love it or hate it, has the RGB code 224-33-138, which means it's made from an intensity of red 
of 224, an intensity of green of 33, and an intensity of blue of 138. And I'll put a link to a site that shows a huge range of all different colours and their names in the art colour theory pack. So if you want to go and have a look at all sorts of different colours and all the weird and wonderful names that they've got, you can go and do that. Another thing that you might like to do is to make up names for each of the tints and the shades that you're mixing today. You could decide to name them for different foods or flowers or things that they look like or maybe name them after the feeling or the mood that they remind you of. And as we're doing this just for fun and to get our creative language ideas flowing, there's no right or wrong names. So you can have fun and be as imaginative as you like, choosing your colour names. And you might like to write the names that you've invented on your monochrome printable above each square. And when you finish mixing all of your tints with your white paint, then start to mix the remaining blobs of pure colour with increasing amounts of black. And then we're going to fill in the four squares to the left of our pure colour on our monochrome sheet. Now, adding black can have a stronger effect than adding white, so be a little bit more careful here. Begin with adding just a tiny bit of black to one of your remaining blobs of colour. A little bit more to the next one, just a little bit more to the next one, and then you can be a little bit, bit more generous with the last one. But you know, just take your time and don't go too crazy and be too enthusiastic with the black. And when you've mixed them all, you can fill in the squares on your monochrome sheet along the row um, with the colours getting darker and darker and darker to show the shades that you've created. And while we work on this row of shades, let's think about monochrome art. Have you heard this word before? Mono means one and chrome means colour. So monochrome art is art that's created using just one colour. We'll have a look at some examples in a minute. Let's look at the work of an artist who's famous for using monochromatic tints, tones and shades in his work. His name is James McNeil Whistler. Here he is. Whistler was an American painter and printmaker. He was born in Lowell, Massachusetts in 1834 and he died in London, England in 1903. He was interested in the links between music and painting and many of his paintings are called by musical names like arrangements, harmonies and nocturnes and they focus on the harmony of colour as he used a colour palette of tints, tones and shades very often in just one colour. Let's take a look at some examples of Whistler's art and as you look at them a really good question anytime you're looking at art is simply to think about what can you see and in this exercise also think about what colours you can see. I think it's really interesting to think about why artists often choose to make monochrome art why do you think they choose to limit themselves to just tints, tones and shades of one colour? Sometimes they might do it to make the painting very simple in colour so that the focus of the art they're creating is instead on the shapes or the texture or perhaps in the way the art was made. Very often they use tints, tones and shades in just one colour to emphasise the light and the dark in a picture and they might use it to create a tranquil effect. So what do you think about having a go at making a painting that uses only this limited colour palette? Do you think it's going to be easier or harder to create a picture if you're only using one colour? And do you think you can create a detailed and expressive picture if you're only using one colour? How do you think you're going to do that? How can you add interest or make a certain mood or feeling if you've only got this colour palette based on tints and shades of one colour? One thing monochrome art often does is draw our attention to where the light is in a painting. And depending on what the painting's of, 
the light might be coming from the sun or the moon or a candle or an electric light or through the window. And the areas where the light falls are painted in the lighter tints. They're the colours that we've made by mixing in white paint. And the areas where the light doesn't reach, which are in shadow, are painted in darker shades. So they're the ones we're mixing with black paint. So look again at a few of the examples of Whistler's paintings and see if you can work out where the light's coming from in his picture. Can you see where he's used tints to show the light and where he's used shades to show the darker shadowy areas? And perhaps you can see some places where he's used a few little pops of another colour to add some interest. And now we've got our palette of tints and shades, let's make our own art inspired by Whistler. For this part of our project, you'll need all of the colours that you've mixed and also a sheet of white paper or card. You'll see I'm using my sketchbook, but any sheet of paper that you have will be fine. You might also want a white pen or a pencil if you have one and a black pen or a pencil too, um, just to add some details later on in the project. Um, and you might also like to have one other colour of paint available to you to add a pop of colour. I'll explain more about that part in a minute. So decide what picture you want to create with your colour palette. I'm using blue paints and I'm going to make an ocean picture inspired by Whistler's river and sea paintings. You can do the same as me or you could choose your own subject to match the colours that you've mixed. I've used a ruler to make the area of my painting a bit smaller than the whole page and I'm starting by using a pencil to draw layers of waves. You can do exactly the same as me, but if you want to do something different and you'd like some ideas, well, let's say that you've chosen to mix tints and shades of red. You could perhaps paint a sunset or a volcano. If you've got tints and shades of yellow, maybe you paint a sunflower. Greens would work well for a forest. If you've got shades and tints of orange, you could make a pumpkin or a ginger cat. And if you've got tints and shades of purple, you might make some flowers, uh, maybe some pansies and some lavender. It would also be really interesting to paint something that isn't made from your chosen colour. That would look really good and you could focus on where the light and dark is um, very well. So maybe if you have created tints and shades of blue, you could paint a blue cat or perhaps you could do a self-portrait in green. Whatever you decide, we want to think about where the light is in our picture and we're going to paint those areas using the lighter tints that we've made. And we're going to paint the areas that have got a lot less light or no light at all using our darker shades. Okay, so you can see from my deep sea picture, I'm using a different tint or shade to paint each layer. The light in this picture would be coming from the sun in the sky above and this means there'd be more light in the top layers of the waves, that's called the sunlight zone, and less light down in the bottom of the sea in what we might call the midnight zone. So if you're doing the same as me, layer your tints and tones from light to dark, top to bottom in your waves. I'm going to fill in all the layers of my ocean in the tints and shades that I've got of blue. So can you think of somewhere in the real world where we see tints, tones and shades? One place that you do see them at work is in photographs, film and television. I don't know if you know, but one of the first ways to take photographs came about with the invention back in 1839 by the French artist Louis Daguerre of what was called daguerreotypes or daguerreotypes. A daguerreotype used a sheet of light sensitive polished silver plated copper to take a picture and this sheet got exposed to light uh, just for a few seconds in brightly lit conditions or for much longer in dark conditions to capture the image. And later on, daguerreotypes were replaced by the more affordable ambrotypes, um, where the picture was captured this time on a sheet of glass. 
And what's interesting is these pictures created a negative picture, which swapped out the light and dark areas of the picture. So let's imagine you were taking a picture of a black cat on a sunny day. The daguerreotype would capture that, showing the black cat in the lightest colours and the sunny day background in darker colours. And to be able to see the correct picture, with the areas of light and dark as they are in the real world, the ambrotype would then get viewed against a dark background. And the first camera pictures and the first movies and the first television programs were all created in what's called grayscale, which is a monochrome colour palette using tints, tones and shades of black and white. And the first colour photographs were only introduced in the 1930s. Movies in colours only became the norm in the 1950s. And colour television only became widely available around the world in the 1960s through to the 1980s. So not all that long ago. And have you seen the Wizard of Oz movie? That's really famous. It's made in 1939. And what it's particularly famous for is its transition from being all in black and white at the start of the movie using tints, tones and shades of black, white and grey to being in full colour once the main character, Dorothy, travels through to the land of Oz. We also see monochrome being used in night vision equipment. And night vision equipment allows us to see in the dark or in really low light conditions. And these pictures are often shown in green and um, in a colour palette that's all different tints, tones and shades of green. So it allows us to see things that are there, but you can't really see what real colour they are. So, and there are animals that see in monochrome too. In our secondary colours lesson, we learned about how the eye works and how we see colour. Um, some animals and a small number of people don't see colour in the way most of us do. They only see in tints and shades of grey, from black through to white. Seals, sea lions, dolphins and whales see in this way. OK, so back to our painting. Now I've got all my waves painted, I'm going to add a little floating boat to the top of the ocean. Um, I'm going to use a different colour from the colour wheel just to add a pop of colour to my boat, just the way Whistler did in some of his paintings that we looked at, do you remember? Um, so let's choose a colour from the colour wheel using one of the colour theory rules that we've learned about in this video series. You can choose whether you want to use a primary colour, a secondary colour, a warm colour to contrast with the blue, or a cool colour to match the blue. Whichever colour you use, um, and if you're not doing an ocean picture, if you're doing something else, see if you can find a way to incorporate a pop of colour if you want to. Um, so whichever colour you use, see if you can name which part of the colour wheel it's from or which colour theory rule you're using. So I'm using orange, so I know that that's a warm colour, which contrasts with the cool colour of the blue. And orange is also directly opposite blue on the colour wheel, which means that blue and orange are contrasting or complementary colours. And if you want to find out more about all these different rules, you can watch the other videos in the colour theory playlist. I'm also going to add a fishing line and a little fish down here using my marker pen and a little bit more orange paint. That's cute. And then once the paint is dry, you might also like to add some extra details. Remember, we talked about how you can add more interest when you've got this limited monochrome colour palette. So I've added some texture um, using extra lines and marks to the wave uh, using a white pencil. You could also use a white marker pen. You can decide whether you'd like to do something like that uh, on your painting too. And uh, to extend your art practice, you might like to go back and complete the monochrome printable by filling in all the extra rows of tints and shades. You could choose two different colours um, and add white and black to them, just like we did in this exercise. 
and make two different rows showing two different colour ranges of the tints and shades. Don't forget you can get a copy of the printable from the art colour theory pack that I've made for us. It's got all of the colour lessons in it, all of the art projects and a bunch of useful printables that you can use for doing your art to make it much easier for you to enjoy the projects or to teach them. Check out the link in the video description if you'd like to get yourself a copy of the pack. You could also experiment with a different medium. So you could use the same colour as you've used in this activity, but instead of using paint, you could see how you can create tints and tones by blending pencils, chalk, or you could try with oil pastels. And you could also create a monochrome collage, so collecting different papers and materials in tints, tones and shades of one base colour. Tear or cut them up into smaller pieces and then use them to create a monochrome collage, sticking them all down with glue. And I think it'd be really fun to draw a portrait using just one colour. It'd be really good because then you really have to think about which areas of the face are lighter and use tints for those areas and which colours of the face are darker and use shades for those areas. So how have you got on? I really enjoyed taking some time out of my day to experiment with these tints and shades. I love using colour theory rules to make colours. I just think it's so cool, so clever, how you just see the colours materialise when you mix them together. How did you get on? Did you like having a limited range of colours to work with? Or did you find it hard? Come and chat in the comments and let me know how you've got on. Did you find it hard? If you did, well done on being open-minded and having a go. That's how we develop and how we get better, being artists and being creative um, and even being scientists. You keep showing up to your art lessons and just trying things. Talking of which, pick one of these to watch next. You could either watch our primary colours lesson, which features the artist Pete Mondrian, or you might like to mix some secondary colours using some art and science magic inspired by the artist George Seurat. Thanks for watching. See you next time.